So first of all, I'm dead addict. Um, 17 years ago or so, I had a different handle um, that was unrelated to computer security. And I remember kind of clearly when that handle was given to me by a good friend of mine, Mind Rape. And he uh, expressed that it was really inappropriate to use the handle I was using in the piracy world for uh, uh, computer security related uh, passions. And I think he was right. Uh, the separation of identities and identity management is really important in these regards. Um, I was a senior member of uh, uh, a piracy group way back when, far past the statute of limitations. Um, uh, Jason Scott, I saw, shoved his hand up there, represent. And it's funny because the only remnant of my belonging uh, to that piracy group can be found on textfiles.com and one of the various NFOs that uh, Jason Scott, uh, the underground's historian of note, has archived. So... If you want to take a look back in memory lane at what the piracy scene was some time ago, go visit textfiles.com. When, when, uh, when I joined the group, uh, the piracy group, I essentially did it because I was pissed off at the quality of the releases of the rest of the pirates. I wasn't really interested in fame. And for some time I had anonymity um, and wasn't even using a handle when I was contributing to that group, but I was so frustrated at the lack of quality assurance in the pirate releases that I wanted to do something about it. For one month, um, uh, one of the groups that um, monitors the pirate activity, and, and it's a, it was a, one of the underground groups, they like to, to keep tally about who's coolest and who's releasing most, but for one month, uh, I, our group was the highest releaser of, of any group out there. Now, we uh, in our space, which was the non-game space, the application space, because uh, while I can play games now and again, I thought the application, uh, getting applications out to kids and to allow them to, to learn was important. But essentially, I was... Uh, right about the time I was most heavily involved was the downfall of piracy as we knew it back then, which was BBS-based. And um, that was a, a very tightly controlled, somewhat uh, closed circles. Um, it Wired.com uh, was not publishing articles on the latest protocols to get your wares at, um, which I appreciate now, but it, it's a different time. One of the other reasons I... Um, uh, had a different handle is that there's really different cultures and at the time there was a conflict between the pirates and uh, the hackers and essentially the pirates I'm not exactly sure what their problem was I think part of them was they were they were afraid of the hackers um, um, some uh, one BBS operator I knew was didn't want to associate with hackers because he didn't want the law enforcement scrutiny which would then find out about his pirate activity um, of course, he ran a, a small telecom, so I don't blame him for those concerns. Um, there's often little respect between the two groups, and, and I, can, I can understand that. Um, I can understand that hackers can look at pirates and say, well, what are you doing exactly? You're just copying bits around. That's not impressive. We're not impressed. There's nothing elite going on there. There's no skills going on there. You're just copying bits. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to use the word theft. We'll talk briefly about ethics, but um, I can understand that. And, of course, the, there, there's an exception to that, and the counter-argument to that is the crackers, um, which is <sighs> stupid terminology, right? Some people want to talk about black hat hackers as crackers. No, the, the software crackers actually were doing interesting work, and they were doing reverse engineering, um, and they were doing very impressive things. But there was a very small percentage of the pirates. But I have a feeling that um, those people... Uh, often moved on to our industry and became badass reverse engineers um, doing things more than just enabling gameplay. So the reason I'm giving this talk is because I, I, I've, I've been coming here, well, forever. Um, and, and through this time, I don't recall many speeches on piracy. And it, I find it really interesting because um, piracy is certainly part of what we'd call the computer underground, and piracy culture has affected us all. Um, 
And the, that separation that happened 17 years ago or so, when I was heavily involved, that's still occurring. Um, we don't talk about it. We don't discuss it. And I think there's interesting issues and, and interesting things to think about. And it saddens me to think that, uh, and I certainly don't want to uh, characterize the, the pirate community negatively, but people that um, aren't thinking about technical issues and, and technical challenges that are just thinking about their distribution mechanisms, it, it saddens me that, that these bright people here at DEF CON aren't thinking about uh, some of these issues. And, and I hope, um, I, I'm not going to give you any definitive answers and you're not going to walk away with any zero day, but I, I hope at the end of all of this, you'll, you'll give some thought to, to some of these issues and, and where we're going in, in piracy and, and what all this means and, and perhaps how we can help. Um, there's certainly some toolkits and some software and some best practices that can be adopted. And, and hopefully, um, even if none of you watch um, that video camera that's stealing my soul, will then transmit it uh, through YouTube and some actual pirates will uh, uh, take a, a close look at, at, at some of these issues. I'd like to get a feel for the audience here. Um, can, can I get a, a raise of hands for everyone that's a pirate, please? Everyone? Everyone? Okay. Now, now can I get a raise of hands for everyone that's not a pirate? Okay, you're all lying. So, <laughs> I, I I don't have any any animosity towards the people that didn't raise their hands at all because they're just people that don't like to raise their hands, and that's cool. I don't blame you for that. <laughs> but yeah, all all of you that say you're not pirates, um, including you, <laughs> are pirates. Um, and and you know. If you, if you start thinking about piracy in a broad context and um, you start looking at piracy, well, the, the textbook that my professor gave me that was photocopied, um, that's piracy too. Um, you know, that, that song that your friend gave you in MV3 format, that's piracy too. Um, and I, I could spend 10 minutes um, fully listing out the kinds and types of piracy and I would be shocked and still call you a liar if you raised your hand and said you weren't a pirate. So back in the day, if you wanted to be a pirate, you had to spend time and energy, and you had to um, get involved with the pirate community. You had to find the BBSs. Then you had to ingratiate yourself to them. You, you had to um, go through quizzes to, to even be allowed into these areas. And uh, an old um, a friend of mine, uh, prosecuting attorney Gail Thackeray, once said that those quizzes, they, uh, law enforcement loves them, and they call those intent so uh, any, any pirates out there, um, if you're still using those things, I swear I'm not a member of law enforcement. I, I swear I'm not a member of the RIAA, all of those things. Um, that shows intent, and you're stupid, and stop that. So there was a barrier to entry uh, at the time, and you know, 17 years ago, the, the computer community wasn't a third of the planet, so it was a lot smaller. Um, now, if you want to learn about the latest piracy techniques and if you want to find out how to get the wares today, if you want to, to get into this, well, I won't call it underground because that would be disingenuous. If you want to get in the piracy scene, um, you don't have to have a friend that has a dial-up to a BBS where you are, are presented with a quiz of silly acronyms. Um, instead, you pretty much have to read Wired. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I, I, I'm always very amused, I've watched over the years, like every, every time a new piracy technology comes out, a new peer-to-peer -peer system, um, any advancements, um, any threats, uh, um, any, any attacks against pirates, all this is covered in the news, and, and you require no skill whatsoever to, to glance around and, and, and see um, exactly how to get your wares. Also, um, well, I'll, there's there's anger I think at, at the content industries, and 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 that's different from 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 where we were 17 years ago. Um, then there really wasn't people justifying their actions. Um, pirates pretty much knew they were pirates. Um, they pretty much knew they were breaking the law. They were doing illicit things, and um, even among themselves, they would acknowledge that they were stealing content. And, and I don't want to get into arguments about semantics, and, and I think that when you steal something, the original person doesn't have it anymore. But nonetheless, uh, people pretty much realized they were sort of doing the wrong thing, and they were doing it anyways. Then. 
But uh, there's a lot of rage at the content industry. And I, I think um, a lot of people, even you know, even older responsible people who would normally th not think of themselves as breaking the law, uh, realized after they bought the LP and then the 8-track and then the cassette and then the CD and then the enhanced CD and, and then uh, the download from uh, uh, iTunes. Th then when their, their telephone carrier comes and says, uh, you need to pay another $3 for a 30-second snippet of that song, there, there, there comes a, a boiling point of rage, I think, when, when people think they're justified to, to violate copyright laws. The, the title of this speech uh, um, is Unfair Use, so I'm not going to try to justify this. I will acknowledge that what I'm talking about here is not fair use. Um, and um, while I sympathize and I have a lot of rage against various content industries for their, their thieving business models, um, and it is sort of thieving, right? Uh, they take my money. I don't have it anymore. They do. That's, that's closer to my definition of theft. Um, the ethical issues are complex, and um, I, I don't. I, I think an entire speech could be spent about the ethical issues of, of piracy, and and I and I hope to see more speeches on piracy and uh, focus speeches on piracy in the future. Um, and I, I hope uh, if any of you get done with this talk and say, "Well, that sucked," I hope you I hope you think why that sucked and what would be a good piracy speech, and then submit that because that would uh, um, bring greater um, breadth to the content of the conference. So one clear thing to me, um, and I don't want to draw lines about what's ethical and unethical, uh, but bootlegging. Bootlegging is different. Uh, bootlegging is not piracy, and I'd like to uh, indeed draw a semantic difference between the two. Um, bootlegging is charging um, for the copyrighted materials and um, making a profit off someone else's uh, um, uh, labor. Um, and, and bootlegging, there's a kind of a commercial bootlegging that goes on, um, and I'm I wish law enforcement luck uh, catching people that print tens of thousands of CDs and then redistribute them and sell them. You know, good luck law enforcement on that, and you go after those guys. Um, but also, there's, there's even to some extent, there's, there's uh, um, money motivations within uh, people we think of as, as pirates and not bootleggers. And it started uh, way back when, when I was actually heavily involved in all of this, and, and that would be um, nodes of BBSs being charged by the pirate groups for distribution. So the pirate groups were trying to actually collect money from various parties. And, and there were some um, um, schisms and, and uh, disagreements uh, that were pretty uh, sincere, and, and people made firm lines, uh, what I would call the more ethical pirate groups, that they would have no part of that, and they would not take money from anyone, which, is, it, and, which essentially makes all of this a large unpaid volunteer effort. And that's largely what the pirate community has been about. Um, while, while there are violations of laws, you essentially have a distributed network of volunteers that often do very tedious, uh, time-consuming things. So I did mention that uh, uh, content piracy is also uh, rampant at universities. Um, I think that's interesting. Um, I, I think, again, that, that goes to the frustration of the people involved of the educational system of, of the textbook industry and uh, having to uh, buy new textbooks every year um, just so the used market does not exist and then, and then pushing professors to use the latest edition which I don't know. I mean, there's there's lots of fields where, um, and there, you know, Greek history hasn't progressed much in the last couple of years. For example, um, I, I, I I'm not a calculus person, but I imagine you know a year or two there's not huge massive changes in how we look and think at calculus. And so again, I, I sympathize with with a lot of the the frustration that, that people have, and. Uh, Again, the ethical issues of uh, reselling the same content to the consumer again and again and again, I think that's an ethical issue of the content industries and uh, some of the piracy we see is reflected on that. So content is king in my mind. Um, and, and different content types, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of enumerate different the sorts of things you can pirate. Um, they've changed. They've, they've expanded a lot over the years. Um, back when I was involved, essentially the only thing that was being pirated was software. Um, that's not true at all anymore. I would imagine that's a um, relatively small percentage of bandwidth anyways. 
Um, so different content types have different characteristics. Um, bandwidth and storage requirements. Um, you know, if you want a lossless Blu-ray collection of every Blu-ray that's ever been made, well, that's um, largely unfeasible, even though there's a small library of Blu-ray discs out now. And those bandwidth storage requirements, when you say, well, I want um, uh, all of the text on a certain subject and I want a library of books in this very specified uh, subject, for example, uh, if you have two gigabytes of, of e-books on aquariums and fish care, um, you can have nearly the whole body of knowledge of the human race in a very tiny, tiny amount of space. So the, the bandwidth and storage requirements are, are one characteristic of the distinctions in content. Um, lossy versus lossless uh, is another, which is interesting. Um, even back when software piracy, there was lossy software piracy as um, people didn't want to distribute all the long trailers and all the long kind of filler content um, because they, they didn't have the bandwidth with uh, their, their slower modems and uh, not high-speed internet, so they would strip out some of the content. That's not really being done in uh, in software anymore. Uh, content is gen uh, software content is generally lossless, um, but the lossy versus lossless does apply to all of these uh, other content types, which I'm going to enumerate. Industry responses. Um, People feel very comfortable pirating some sorts of content. Uh, for example, ebooks. Um, there are a few vocal authors, and there's some movement within the e uh, uh, publishing industry to realize there's uh, what they feel is a growing threat. Um, and, and there's other industries and, and uh, areas where there's, there's no response whatsoever. For example, instructional videos. Um, you know, there's, there's sites that have large collections of magic tutorial uh, DVDs that have been ripped. And, and the content uh, industry and their response to that um, is not unified and really affects uh, the viability of pirating their content and the risk management involved with the people uh, doing so. Um, metadata management. Um, so I, I, I care a lot about metadata. Metadata to me is really important. And it becomes important as more and more data is amassed and more and more data is available uh, through illicit means. If there's not good metadata and clean metadata, it becomes a, um, a real problem. And uh, I've had people tell me that I have such a passion for metadata, I should go into information, uh, information sciences. Um, the difficulty to import and rip and crack, I think, is another data point, and that differs from content type. Um, for example, music now, there's no, no problem um, uh, uh, ripping that and cracking that, and, and DVDs as well. Um, there's still some software that's a challenge. I think, interestingly enough, ripping books is a real challenge. Even though there's, there's successful books, um, oftentimes it's just the images, and oftentimes if they do OCR, there's problems with that OCR, and then there's multiple revisions going on. Um, and the availability and, and popularity is another, another um, uh, characteristic of content. For example, you know, one of the content types that, that's being pirated is, is knitting uh, 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 blueprints and whatnot. And you pretty much have to know to go to the right spot. You know, the Pirate Bay will not serve you for your very, very niche interests. Um, which, you know, is, is the content industries around that would be very happy about that. Um, but then that means if you care about that, then you have to find out the still um, sort of underground and member only and, and make the time investment uh, to pirate. Um, and another thing about uh, metadata I just want to touch about is, is one of the nice things about MP3s, for example, and, and even images, is, is those file formats support having a lot of rich metadata within them. And that means the metadata will stay with the content as it's moved from system to system. And there's other content types that don't have as rich of metadata available to them within the file format itself, which means separate files are often created that include that metadata. Those separate files are often lost, your metadata is lost, and and um, the data becomes a lot less valuable in my perspective. So content type software, I've talked about that a good deal. Um, I would call it largely the oldest type of piracy and, and the, old, the first content type that there was a, a full scene around and um, a community around. Um, audio content, um, um, music. 
So there's, there's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if any of you remember when MP3s first came out, but it took a long time to rip them, and that was a characteristic of, of that content type, and it prevented uh, entry and it prevented people from from uh, um, taking that content. Um, there was bandwidth issues, and at the time, people were ripping into very, very low formats, and and there was a lot of loss going on. So the lossy versus lossless um, kind of progressed over time with audio piracy. Um, to the point now where we're almost at a point where um, we've we've gone from various levels of lossy to lossless, and FLAC is not u yet ubiquitous or or other equivalents of FLAC. But I think in the near near term future, as what terabytes cost eighty dollars or something now, um, I, I I think these storage issues um, will work themselves out for audio. Um, video, uh, again, you can watch the progression, and while there's uh, many people now that want the full DVD reps, and having four gig uh, downloads is more and more common, uh, the Blu-ray reps are still less common, and that's for bandwidth and, and hard drive purposes. Um, books, very interesting. Um, they're tiny, they're easy to transport, which is which is interesting characteristic. They're a lot harder to rip. Um, there requires a lot of manual intervention there, uh, other than when people get electronic versions of the books, but um, that traditionally hasn't been how that content has been imported. But in, and in each of these, you can separately follow the content types and, and look for trends and see where we are and see where we're going. Um, there's often many revisions on books. You don't see that with audio files. You don't see that with MP3s. Well, here's the fourth attempt um, with a, roughly the same characteristics because people catch those OCR errors and they have the Rev C and whatnot of the books. Um, fonts. Um, Fonts very small. Um, the industry cares uh, a fair amount, but you'll probably never get caught stealing fonts if you don't use those fonts commercially. Um, if you want to put up a big billboard with some nifty stolen font, you'll probably get busted for that. And I don't know. In my mind, as well, you should. Um, and and you know, among the ethical issues that the the places I've personally stood is if you're making profit from this. Um, even if you're not selling it, but, it, but if you're getting compensation somehow, if you're using this in your job to make a profit, then that's probably not okay. Um, clip art uh, also. Um, and it's interesting. You, you, go, you go to conferences and whatnot, and, and uh, conferences of all types, and it's like copyrights don't exist. I mean, the images on the screen, like, look at this cool comic I stole. Look at this picture I got from somewhere on the net. Um, and um, I, I'll, 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 I'll pick on a speaker here, um, but I won't name him because that would be mean. But there's a prominent, uh, well-known speaker at uh, DEF CON, um, a good guy. Um, and he wrote a, a number of books. And in one of his books, I noticed a picture. And I'm like, wow, that's, a, that's an awesome picture. I, I was in it, so, you know. Um, but I'm like, I know who took that picture, and I'm pretty sure they're a professional photographer. Uh, and this is what they do for a living. And you just published a book with them. I'm like, so you, I'm sure you contacted the, the, the photographer um, and, and asked them about that. And they're like, no, 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 no. I got that picture from the internet. I'm like, wow, what a coincidence. I got Photoshop from the internet. Um, <laughs> that was a long time ago. I don't have that copy of Photoshop anymore. Um, but, the, but this person li like literally has written on cyber ethics and, and, and is trying to, to bring cyber ethic issues to the forefront and thought nothing of that, uh, or at least it didn't seem so to me. I, I won't say any more about that because I'll figure out who he is soon. Um, magazines, another content type. And the, you have the similar issues with ripping it as you did with books, but I think one of the interesting things about magazines is the industry response. Their, their business model is not selling their old copies of their magazines. So by and large, when you have old issues of some relatively obscure magazine, they generally don't care. There's exceptions. Um, I think Playboy is probably reselling their old content. Um, boobies don't get dated, you know. Um, National Geographic also has uh, a lot of content, and uh, they put together in electronic format. So some of these care, but generally not so much. Um, knitting patterns, um, it, it, th that's interesting because there, there certainly is some uh, industry response there and, and, and people concerned about their, their um, intellectual property from, from being taken. Um, Three-dimensional data. Um, and I, I bring this up um, because I think this is something that we don't see a lot of right now. 
Um, and I've certainly seen libraries of 3D models and whatnot um, on sort of obscure places. But I think you'll see it in the future. And I think um, that's one thing that will become more prevalent and more ubiquitous. And uh, I spoke about piracy at about DEF CON 2 or, or 3. I think it was DEF CON 2 I spoke about piracy. And at that time, I, I made the prediction that audio piracy was going to be ubiquitous. Um, and at the time, I thought it was an obvious thing to state, but it certainly wasn't ubiquitous at the time. It was very clunky, and, and uh, CDB wasn't around, and metadata was difficult, and ripping was difficult. And um, a, a, As three-dimensional data is used more and more, and, and compelling content is created from that, I think we can expect three-dimensional data to uh, be pirated as well. Threats to piracy. <clears throat> well... There's a couple of non-technical threats uh, to, to piracy, and that's the legal system and the industry. And these aren't uh, technical threats that you can add software to and protect yourself to. You can, you can try to avoid detection, um, but essentially once you're detected, um, if the legal system engages you, um, either the civil uh, or the criminal legal system, then, then that's, that, that's a large threat. Mo most of the time, I think this is done to dissuade piracy, and, and there's been a, a, number, a, a small number of uh, people that have um, uh, gotten busted uh, for non-commercial piracy infringement. Um, and the industry responses, obviously, the RIA uh, and the MPAA have campaigns, and, and they've, they've conducted legal action themselves. As far as criminal actions, well, the D DMCA does, does have criminal provisions in it. And um, people have spent time in jail for writing software. Um, people have spent time in jail for software that enables copying of, of bits of data. Uh, Dimitri uh, Skyvlar, uh, I'm sure I've mangled his last name, um, is, is a prime example. There's ramifications to this. Um, it can uh, backfire. There can be backlash. Um, people can be more pissed off. And, and once... Uh, you know, people see their friends and families being sued for ridiculous amounts of money by the record companies. And that might uh, um, piss them off even more and make them less supportive of, of their efforts in the future. Um, one of the interesting threats, I think, to um, oh yeah, one of the interesting things I uh, and most fun threats to piracy I see is free content. <laughs> um, when when content is freely given away, oh. I don't know, I um, say watching The Daily Show on your computer, right? Well, there was a time when you could download, uh, um, illegally download Daily Show episodes, and then you'd watch those. And, but then uh, they put them online. And really, why would you go through the, the trouble? And there's a time factor in all of this. Um, why would you go through the trouble of pirating it when you can just watch it streaming from the people that are distributing it? And, and I don't think people really mind a little 30 second ad now and again. Um, people are willing to put up with advertising to get their content. And as this happens more and more, I think you'll see the uh, piracy community pirating this content less and less. If, if it's available for free, streaming legitimately, um, it's just too much trouble for the average person. Now, there may still be archives. You're never going to eliminate piracy, but um, there may still be archives and people supplying this content, but people aren't going to be stealing it when they're being given it. Um, and I don't mean to use the word steal so much, but um, free academic texts. Um, yeah, I talked about the the, the copying of uh, textbooks and whatnot, but the MIT and other universities are starting to realize that they, it's in the interest of everyone to make the content that they create uh, freely available. And, and I really think um, on a personal level that if a university doesn't have a mission to promote the exchange of information and ideas and to make these uh, freely available to academics and non-academics alike, then the universities are, shouldn't be there and they're doing the wrong thing. And um, I, I, in, in that context, I, I, I don't have much sympathy for those that, that want to pirate that content because um, a academics should be creating information for other people to consume and, and furthering the body of knowledge in the human race. The problem with, uh, um, and, and this is a threat to, the, these are threats to piracy, and it's, it's, it's kind of a wonderful threat. I hope these threats uh, come true, right? I, I hope that uh, if piracy is going to be reduced or eliminated, I hope it's because content is um, uh, freely available. Um, oh, another threat in regards to audio content, and I have a, um, uh, I've, I've paid for streaming audio services. 
$20 for a year, and then you have all these options, and then it's not a big deal. You know, it's the cost of a lunch, and suddenly you can, you can get playlists, and, and you, know, it, you don't have to manage your own playlist and figure out what you want. And, and I think it, it's not only free content, but very cheap and affordable content could very much uh, undermine uh, the piracy and the piracy, pirate community. The problem with all of these things, by and large, except for the, the actual um, licensed free academic text where they say, okay, this is Creative Commons, this is really free. Uh, the problem is that any of the other content that's being given away cheaply or freely, um, advertiser supported, can go away at any time. And uh, um, while they're giving it away now, there's no assurances they'll, they'll be giving away in the future. Some technical threats to piracy. Um, the first is the black hat, the hackers, us. <coughs> no, not, not really us so much, the, the actual bad guys. Um, it seems these attacks are financially motivated, and essentially these are people uh, attempting to make money and steal um, based on the, their knowledge that people will pirate. Um, and these include uh, malware distribution. And it's already illicit content, so people don't have assurances of its integrity, which they should have, and this can be done, and we need to address this. Um, and I'll talk briefly about that in a minute. Um, bogus codecs are, are an obvious one. They're a lot of fun. Oh, you need, you need to go to this strange, strange site to download this software to view this movie. Um, well, probably not. I, and I think people are... Um, even non-security oriented people are now being made aware that this is probably not appropriate and, and that social engineer attack won't work uh, much more. Um, root kits. Oh, terrifying things. Well, there's not viruses being installed on them. You know, back, back in the day, you could just run an antivirus scanner, you know, with its tiny amount of signatures. Um, but now, if someone puts a custom root kit into a piece of software, um, you'll never know it's there. And if it was only distributed that one piece of software, um, no one will probably ever detect it. Now, how likely is this to occur? Well, a few years ago, I'm, I'm at Black Hat. And I'm wandering the halls, and, and a gentleman and an acquaintance, and I'd even call him a friend. Um, who can be an ac asshole? Um, he came up to me, and he's like, so do you have any wares? I'm like, wares? What do you mean? Like, software? Is that what you want? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Like, Maybe I have a copy of Photoshop laying around or something. I kind of quit collecting software. Software is really difficult to maintain, by the way. If, if you want to be a pirate and if you want to have a large collection of software uh, and then you want to uh, pay attention to all the maintenance releases and the version increases and whatnot, that becomes a full-time job and you're not actually using any software. Um, so, I mean, you know, there, there are still people dedicated enough to volunteer their time to that, that futile process. But um, at, at the time, I'd given up years ago, so I didn't really have much software. And I'm like, well, maybe I have a Photoshop or something laying around. Um, and he's like, so where did you get it? Like, well, what do you mean, where did I get it? Where did you get that copy? I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe in like a torrent site or something? He's like, no, no, I don't want it. I'm like, Really? Why don't you want it? I mean, like, you know, where where should I be getting it? He's like, well, you know, people install rootkits on these things and then distribute them via Tor networks. I'm like, really? How do you know this? He's like, well, I do this. <laughs> and uh, that's why I mentioned he could be kind of an asshole. And I'm like, fuck you, you asshole. <laughs> Jesus. And, and I must admit, um, while I'm, I'm not a real software person, after that conversation many, many years ago, um, beyond the statute of limitations, um, at, at that point in time, um, and, and don't do the math of when BitTorrent came out in the statute of limitations, thanks. Um, at that point in time, I, I, even though I had really wasn't collecting software or using software, um, I uh, became a lot more paranoid and a lot more cautious, and it became even less likely that I would do so. And, and this is, uh, that sort of thing is a, a very good reason why the, the people, the pirate groups that, that create these releases need to uh, have some data in integrity and be aware of their own reputation. Because if someone get, downloads one of these things, gets owned by a rootkit, root they're not going to think that the, the asshole black hat who silently re-uploaded it is responsible. They'll probably look at the release group that uh, released it um, and blame them. 
Um, the other, the other, the other side of the threats is the content industry. Um, and so they hire people that kind of do malicious things to, to various piracy networks and services and they, they flood with bad content. Um, there's network disruptions. Um, and, and, you know, things like network di di disruptions, essentially, it's a security arms race. And, and these sorts of things, as a security community, we can look what they're doing. We can uh, take countermeasures. We can improve our protocols. We can look at these problems, and we can address them. And that's, that's something uh, people in this room can do. Uh, well, a couple of you, maybe. Um, the the flooding with, with fake content, which is another thing they do, um, I, I think is... Um, can be mitigated by the people that are releasing this software, um, realizing that their reputations as criminals, but, but they really care about reputation. I mean, all this volunteer work is being done, and essentially the only thing they gotta get out of it is the ego within their own community. And I'm sure we don't know anything about that here. <laughs> and, and thanks to all the volunteers at DEF CON, we, we would not have DEF CON without volunteers. Um, the, the, the tech industry, when they're attacking and when they're, they're creating these disruptions, they know they're not going to stop piracy. That's not really their aim. What they're trying to do is make it annoying and make it difficult enough where they'll dissuade enough people. And, and that's what they're trying to do. And, and they succeed in, in, a number of, uh, in a lot of ways. So I, I think some of these threats can be uh, addressed, and I think some good crypto and, and some good signatures, and, and, and I'll go into a little bit of that more. There are many things we can address to reduce many of these threats. However, there is one thing that is very, very difficult, if not near impossible. Um, and to think that we can secure piracy or prevent uh, law enforcement from, from finding these folks is, is ridiculous. Um, to, to think that we can prevent um, the content industries from, from doing stuff about this is also ridiculous because there's, there's a threat that's non-technical and it's not legal um, and it's infiltration. And the law enforcement uses this method and the content industry uses this method and... I remember when I was involved uh, way back when, um, when I was very active, I, I was really puzzled why piracy exists at all. And I had an assertion that I believe was kind of true at the time. And my assertion was that if you gave me six months, maybe, I, I don't even think I think I needed anyone else. You just give me six months and um, I can probably kill off 90% of the pirate groups in the country, uh, if not the world. And I really believe that's a feasible thing. And uh, I don't think it's easy to protect against infiltration. And I assure you that all of the uh, people attempting to infiltrate know what those acronyms meant. Um, they can pass all the little quizzes that you throw at them. Um, and many times they're, they're uh, um, very familiar with the, the, the pirate scene themselves. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. So um, defense, sign your criminal content. Um, that's really important. You're distributing illegal things. Put your signature on it. Um, that sounds kind of ridiculous. I realize this. But the fact of the matter is that all these groups are already um, signing in a way, in an insecure way, their content. These groups are putting out facts, and they're listing out members of facts, and they have the name of their group after it, and they talk about their, their distribution headquarters sometimes. And, and the, the groups don't silently release these things anonymously. They, they care about their reputation, and they try to be, you know, um, release stuff the fast or the most uh, prolific. Um, um, and, and, and so reputation actually means a lot to them. It's, it's all they have. So what needs to happen is that they need to um, sign their metadata, and their metadata talks about their release. Um, and they need to defend their reputation. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how exactly. I mean, you can use X509-based signing. You can use PGP-based signing. But what needs to happen in the, in the community is there needs to be some standardization, and everyone needs to start doing roughly the same thing. Um, and I think this is a key to help their reputations and to help the integrity of the data that's being copied. And also, at the end of the day, because, because of the malware that's being distributed and the rootkits are being distributed, um, regardless of how you feel about piracy, there's probably not a lot of people here, except for that one in the back, that wants bigger botnets and wants more malware out there. And um, it, if the integrity of this data is, is not uh, there, then this malware will continue to be propagated. 
I like metadata. I like metadata a lot. So there's a couple kinds of metadata that are associated with each piece of content. One is the kind of the pure descriptor of the content itself, and a good example of that is the information you'll find at IMDb. Um, and there's a ton of it um, in that example. You know, who's in the movie, all the credits, um, all sorts of metadata can be grabbed, and and that describes the actual content. Now, pirates don't need to include any of that, really. Um, what their metadata needs to include a pointer to the metadata for the actual content, but their content is different than the actual content. Um, their content um, has things like your release group, uh, your quality, your version, your co codecs used, um, the hash of the actual files that, that you're talking about. So um, you, you describe that file and how what its characteristics are and, and give a lot of information so people can look at it and analyze it. And then hopefully, in an ideal world, we can do this in a relatively standardized way. Because the moment we standardize all this metadata uh, and, and, and signatures, then we can use other tools to look at this and to browse content um, and to make uh, uh, piracy uh, a much more enjoyable experience. And, and I certainly... Uh, I certainly look forward to, oh, I don't know, not really, Google's view of the, version of the future. Their version of the future is every, all the content in the world is available at your fingertips. That's their vision of the future. And I'm with them there up until the point that Google hosts it all. Um, so the, the idea of a ubiquitous global library, I think, is um, a really compelling one. And I think um, that vision can make the world a better place. Um, so... There's no risk to the signing. Like the idea of signing your criminal acts, signing uh, the information that, that admits that you're a criminal, you've already admitted you're a criminal and being part of one of these groups and you're already telling people what your, your uh, uh, information about, about your group. Um, and your private key, well, yeah, that's going to be on your hard drive. But if it gets to the point where people are knocking down your, your door and taking your hard drive, the private key is probably the least of your worries. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. A couple of other points I want to touch upon is the idea of bodies of knowledge. And I talked about it before a little bit with um, um, fish information, right? All the aquarium information you could possibly want to know about. And if you go online, you'll notice that there's these body of knowledge, bodies of knowledge in academic areas and in specific areas of content, uh, particularly with ebooks, because ebooks are are small enough where you can actually distribute huge, large of, um, bodies of knowledge. Um, and it, what you get is um, nearly all books on X, Y, and Z uh, subjects. Um, and currently, there's there's uh, bodies of uh, these collections of of content that are. Um, four, eight, or 16 gigs large. But as our uh, storage capacity increases, uh, and Blu-ray becomes a ubiquitous and affordable and whatnot, um, and our bandwidth also increases, you'll see these bodies of knowledge. And essentially, you have private librarians maintaining these and, and maintaining their own personal archives of, of these bodies of knowledge. And, and this is going to happen. This is uh, going to continue into the future. And it's kind of exciting. Um, Another note I want to make is uh, regarding hard drives. Um, the hard drive manufacturers know this. There was a, there was a point in my uh, life when I was um, pirating software, which I, I don't do because I'm risk averse these days because my asshole friend. Um, but there was a time I said, I uh, don't support the software industry. I support the hardware industry. And I think that's true with a lot of pirates. Um, <coughs> They spend a lot of money on hard drives. They spend a lot of time on computer hardware. And the hardware manu the hard drive manufacturers have stated this publicly. They know that terabyte drives that they're selling and the quantity of their selling um, are not being filled up with high definition quality content of their children uh, running around. No, they know that pirates make their business viable. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to have been a part of that. <laughs> Way back past when the statute of limitations occurred, of course, um, and 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 w as we see uh, petabyte drives in the future, uh, we'll see these bodies of knowledge increase to to a great amount. And the, there's one one type of piracy that will be um, nearly impossible and has been nearly impossible to to deal with, and the content industries won't be able to do anything about it, can't do anything about it, and that is physical exchanges of information. 
you go to someone's house, you send them a hard drive in the mail, and suddenly they have a terabyte of this content. Maybe you send it encrypted. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, but I think the important thing is we have integrity in our data. We have clearly classified data. Uh, we have rich metadata and um, that we sign our content um, and that uh, there's some standardization within the pirate community that the, there's XML formats that people can agree on of how they're going to describe their metadata for these various releases that you can do per content type um, and I think that will also increase the security of uh, the internet as people are not uh, infected with as much malware. Um, it's my understanding that I'm going to be taken uh, to another question and answer room in a few minutes here, or a couple of minutes. I have about three or so minutes left in my speech. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for coming, and um, be ethical, uh, have fun, and um, um, thanks for coming. <laughs>